Ryan Ray and Ben Samuels present Bring In The Closers, a podcast on making deals and doing business. Welcome to uh, another edition of Bring In The Closers. No, Ben and I did not get a divorce. Um, yes, we did have couples counseling and we're back. And so it's good to be back. Ben, um, how's it going, sir? Go well. You might notice that I'm in some new digs uh, today. This is uh, the, the new place in Midland here. I'm getting settled. Been here for about a week. Um, it's nice and like 30 degree outside. So I'm like taking advantage of the, the one week of winter out here. This is your fourth, you, you fifth? You're counting something. I'm trying to count how many mansions you have now. Like you just bought, you just like, yeah, I just bought a new mansion. You know, it's pretty cool. I'm just chilling here in my nice lounge chair. Um, it's, uh, it's I mean, as, I, as I said before we were on air, I mean, I think that this place could probably fit in like one of your closets. Mm. So, I mean, it, mm. it all kind of depends on perspective, I suppose. Um, okay. Okay. I'm not going to dispute that. So that's fine. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, we took off. God, it's been a couple of weeks. I don't know. How long has it been since we re- recorded a show? You were moving while I was out of town. I was in Nicaragua. You were moving. Um, felt like we And then I was at the Bush China deal. So it's been two weeks since we recorded, hasn't it? It has been. Yeah. Oh. I, uh, I missed it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. And then I'll be off next week. I'll be in China. And then we'll be back the week of Thanksgiving. Just a couple of programming notes there. We do have a guest on today. In the meantime, Ben, what are we going to talk about? I have a slight idea. You were at a conference last week with a lot of high level executives at Midland. Um, we hadn't got to talk off very much about it. I am curious going to an event like that with a lot of people who, you know, were CEOs and executive types, a lot of wheeler and dealer types in the room. Um, did you glean anything from being in a crowd with a lot of high powered individuals? Was there some takeaways? Was there some things where you go, you know what? I like the way that this guy or gal presented themselves or presented the information. Um, was there anything that you gleaned from that conference that would be useful for folks who didn't get to attend that, um, or trying to aspire to, to reach those kind of heights? Yeah. So I'm going to answer that in a kind of a roundabout way. You know, I was actually having breakfast breakfast with a guy this morning that was at the conference as well. He's been in uh, the midstream and water transfer space for, for years now. And, you know, as we've talked on the battle and podcast, you know, I, I've made that shift in my, you know, my business just over the last, you know, nine to 12 months. And so I'm relatively new, still drinking from a fire hose. Um, but at the same time, you know, I feel like being out in Midland as much as I am, even though I'm, I'm just recently a full-time resident, um, you know, again, uh, I've got a pretty good finger on the pulse. And, and so, you know, one of the things that we were talking about this morning is that it's amazing to me how a lot of the conferences and a lot of the talks are almost drawn up with like a blind eye to the fact that people that are in that room that are industry professionals that have a full pulse in the market are going to be able to call BS on, on a lot of things that are being talked about and being, you know, uh, presented in these presentations uh, and I don't say that necessarily as a, as a complete negative, but I just it's interesting to me that those presentations don't take a more realistic approach to, okay, the people in this room probably all talk together on a daily basis. And so I need to make sure that I'm actually you know, bringing value in my talk and talking about something that is, that is not you know, mundane or routine or, or you know, just second nature to these people. Because one of the things, you know, the reason I say this, because one of the other things that I was thinking about at this conference specifically you know, so this was mostly executive level people at this at this water forum. There were probably there were probably a couple three hundred people in the room. So I mean, it was well attended. Um, I was definitely, I would imagine, you know, just because of my scope of experience in this space, I was probably one of the least experienced people in the room in terms of knowledge base on on full stack how this industry works. Um, but at the same time, you know, for I listened to what about six hours of talks. And I didn't come away with very much, oh, that was new, or oh that oh that's interesting. Right. And so if I'm taking that away, I can only imagine what the you know the 20 year vet is sitting there thinking. Um, and also, you know, uh, kind of dovetailing off of that, I thought that there were, you know, there's a lot of, especially in this conference, but I think it's kind of rampant across a lot of these, is that it, you know, it's the same talk. Um, you know, that was given 18 months ago or, you know, one, so one of the talks and not to call them out, um, actually I won't name who it was, but one of the, you know, one of the private equity firms, uh, one of the banking uh, groups went up and gave a talk and, you know, of course they're going to talk about how they expect to see $75 oil next year and how they, uh, they're, they're expecting to see an upward tick in the market. Cause I mean, they're not paid to stand up there and give you the, the base case or, or the negative case. Right. And so it kind of, I mean, you and I have talked about this a lot on uh, offline, but it's almost like, 
you know, you go there for the networking and, and you go there for like having been in the room more than the value of the actual talks, which is totally, I would imagine it's totally counterintuitive to the point. Right. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I don't know. And again, I, I know that a lot of that was pessimistic. I mean, I think they are valuable for the networking, but in terms of the content driven stuff, I kind of find it to be lacking a lot of times. No, I, I, I agree. And that's why I was curious about this one. I haven't, I've seen this one and have, thought about going several different times but never have made it and the main reason is that conferences that are heavy lecture based i have found historically to be and i've given some of these myself so (laughs) i'm guilty as charged but to be um not really much beyond um um you know what you know a a surface level synopsis would be and one of the things i would encourage um, folks to consider is a couple things part of the problem is when you're publicly traded, obviously you have to be concerned about you know shareholders getting wind of you saying something and then your stock price being impacted or some kind of crazy SEC violation or, or whatever the case may be. But counter to that, I would say that um, Elon Musk, um, I've been critical of him multiple times in the past. Um, however, one of the things he does well is that he has the 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 personality that makes people believe in what he's doing despite the diminishing returns their investment might give them which has for some reason um kept their stock you know pretty inflated in my opinion um and maybe he'll turn the corner because of that and so i think there is danger in you know these ceos of publicly traded companies going out and saying the wrong thing but i think they also miss that people resonate with people and that you know people that listen to the show regularly are people who like the things that we say people who turn it on and turn it off for people who don't like the things that we say um but you can actually grow a loyal group of people in the industry who want you to succeed, who want to hear what you have to say by being a little bit more off the cuff, a little bit more down to earth, um, and not trying to you know, water everything down to where everyone in the room is like, yeah, okay, we, we, we heard that before. And I think that that's kind of a frustration that, 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 that that's why I don't attend a lot of those type of events because there's, there's not that value and we really want to hear what you really think. And I understand the fear and you have an obligation to stockholders. Um, it feels like there should be a, a way to, um, for these companies to, to remedy that because, you know, as social media, uh, we, we think about social media impact now, but it's, it's probably very early on on the impact of what will happen compared to what will be five, ten years from now. Companies are going to have to figure out ways to get their message out there in the social media world. And, you know, what you don't want then is what you don't want to be is a CEO who's giving these watered down speeches, these watered down quarterly calls, and then caught you know, on a cell phone at some business meeting saying something contradictory or completely more, um, um, using maybe, maybe using hyperbole, but, you know, it completely shifts the narrative. And so I think CEOs are in an interesting time period where, you know, 20 years ago, they come out to quarterly calls, they could get the Wall Street Journal, they could control the interviews. And now you're starting to see that, 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 that um, that, that trend to shift. And I wonder how, especially folks in our industry will take that and figure out how to use it to their advantage. And the ones that do, um, much like Aubrey McClendon had a very much a, I don't want to use this in a negative term, but a cult like following. He's a very renowned figure in oil and gas. Um, despite the fact he made a lot of blunders, he had a lot of things, but people resonated with his personality because the way he handled things, people like, I like the way that he does that. And so I'm curious, um, if we'll see that trend, um, in oil and gas with the publicly traded companies as we move forward. No, I mean, to your point, I mean, yeah, you don't really, at those talks, I don't think you ever really get to see the personable side of those. They're just very sterilized, just kind of boilerplate. Um, and I mean, one of the other things that I was thinking about, and I kind of, I kind of mentioned earlier, but, uh, you know, so if you're talking about one of the, let's use this conference specifically. So, you know, one of the, the larger water transfer firms in, in the Permian gets up there and their head of uh, business development is giving a talk on, you know, their 2018 performance, 2019 performance and 2020 projection. You know, it's likely that there's a few dozen people in that room that are probably current clients. Right. And so if, if you're talking about things that are, that are not backed up by, by fact, you know, you're going to get called out whether, you know, verbally or not. Uh, but number two, you know, if you're talking about like very generic, just kind of broad strokes and you have some, for lack of better phraseology, some bad takeaways and some bad you know, uh, market, uh, uh, you know, dynamic takeaways, or whatever you want to call it, you, you know, you're maybe at risk of losing customers. Because, I mean, you know, if I'm if I'm sitting there and I'm a customer of somebody that you know, is very, you know, 
has a lot of competitors in the space and their guy is standing up there just espousing falsehoods, you know, that's going to register with me, right? And so I think you kind of got to walk the line. And I mean, this industry, I think more than most, you know, when you're talking about oil and gas, especially when you're talking about out here in the Permian, I mean, everybody knows everybody's business to a certain degree. And so there's only like a little bit you can get away with. Um, and I think that you're, I think I see that more in the water and midstream and uh, infrastructure space than I do in minerals because minerals seems to be a lot more vast um, and and there are you know a lot more uh, players there. Um, and do, and do you see the same thing? Or that's an interesting. I haven't thought about it in those terms, so you're kind of catching me off the cuff here. And it's space. So I'm more familiar with the space that you were at, and you're more familiar with the space that you're referring to. So it is interesting, and uh, I'd had to, I'd have to chew on that before I gave you an appropriate answer. But I think you, you definitely might be onto something there. One of the things that um, when I was in Nicaragua this past week that that, that stood out to me was obviously I speak very, very, very little Spanish. Um, uh, enough that if I were in a, you know, lost in a, in a village, I could say a handful of words and probably get potentially what I needed. But that would be like, how do I get out of here? Or where's the hospital? You know, very, very small stuff. Um, so I was depending on translators all week. Um, and one of the things that you learn when you speak through a translator is when if you become aware, and I say aware in this sense, is that you become aware um, how much slang you use, or you know, um, you know, colloquialisms or, or metaphors or whatever, and those don't translate. Um, and one of the things that that I try to do when I'm speaking through a translator is make sure that I, I use my um, oh gosh, what's the term for this? My facial expressions, my hands. Um, I, I, I'll monitor the pitch of my tone a lot more so that while the information is being translated from me to the person receiving it, the person hearing my tone, while they don't know what I'm saying, they can, they can infer from my tone the type of message that I'm trying to get across. Now, if I'm talking to you or if I'm talking to, to Nate or someone else, I, I might, you know, raise a voice or whatever or be loud. I'm kind of a loud guy anyways, but I'm not nearly as aware of that. And I thought about that from some of the things we talked about in the past is that it kind of dawned on me this past week is that there's a lot of times where I'm probably not as careful in my messaging because I presume the person I'm speaking to, because I speak English, will understand what I'm saying, and that that can cause confusion. And so it was just kind of a reminder to, for me this week because I was on the other end. I was in an impoverished nation and not executives, but I had to communicate, and I had to communicate through someone else to get my message across. Um, and so it was just a good reminder that, you know, for people who are wanting to put together deals or, or wanting to be successful in business or, or sales that don't take for granted that the message that you are espousing is going to be received the way that you are. Make sure that you are careful with your terms. And um, it, was, it was a good reminder because I haven't thought about that at that level in a while because I haven't had to talk to a translator. Does that does that kind of – do you see where I'm getting that, that? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, th- there have been times where I mean, you and I, you know, you and I talk on a daily basis and there have been times, you know – recently that you and I had to kind of take a step back and, and reframe you know, some of the things that we were talking about because it wasn't being, uh, you know, wasn't being conveyed the right way and it wasn't being received the right way. And so, I mean, yeah, I think that that's, I mean, I, you know, I think it, and no matter what relationship you have, parent, child, spouse, spouse, business owner, business owner, business owner, client, I mean, pick a dynamic. That's an ever, you know, ever changing uh, dynamic. And that's something that you need to be cognizant of because, I mean, a lot of times, I mean, it's, it sounds cliche, but a lot of times it's not what you're saying. It's how you're saying it, you know, that's really going to get the point across. And, and that's what the person to be left with. And so if you can, you know, if you take the forethought to frame what you're saying and really think through it, as opposed to just, you know, take it for granted that the person's going to understand where you're coming from, I, I think that that can solve a lot of problems on the front end. So if we bring this full circle in and we say, OK, you have the high level executives who are kind of speaking a watered down message to a room full of people who actually want to care. I mean, actually want to hear what they have to say. They really are. They're there. They're paying money to hear these people speak. On the other end of the spectrum, you have people who are trying to communicate through a translator and they want to hear um, which you have to say just as much for different reasons, but they want to hear what you have to say just as much. The takeaway might be is that um, what I was alluding to a minute ago is if you can get your message across 
to the right audience, if you're in the right audience, you do show you care and you figure out the way where you obviously you're taking care of your, your shareholders or your clients or whatever. You're not throwing them under the bus, your company on the bus. You can probably be more successful than these conferences where if we're being honest about our industry right now, there's a lot of bad press. There's a lot of bad press and we don't have those dynamic CEOs who are out there. Um, that generate goodwill from the public, generally speaking. And so, you know, I would submit to you, Ben, that for the folks who listen to this show and are looking to do stuff um, in the industry, being aware of that and, and, and seeing what you saw, re- remember how that feels when you are when you go to something and you're let down in the message. And not being let down because you tried your best and it just didn't work, but being let down because the person didn't give you what you wanted, and y'all both knew that there was not the effort or the intent to do it there. Um, because trying to convey the message, the other day we, you mentioned a conversation where we kind of had to stop and reset. It was both, I think, clear in one of those where we were both trying to say something, but for whatever reason it wasn't communicated, so it was easy to stop and then restart that conversation because we could, we both could feel that there was there was a, a, a passion or whatever you want to say to, to resolve the issue, um, and that was being communicated because we were being, okay, well, this, you know, and so... Um, I think if you take those two extremes and you look at it and say, well, if you're trying to be successful in sales or, or business leadership or whatever, um, being careful in how you communicate and also talk to the audience, whoever that might be, whether it's one person or a group of people, in a manner that, that they at least appreciate that you are coming across as this message is important and you're trying to do your best to communicate. It doesn't mean you always succeed, but at least the audience will respect that. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So I know we only have a couple minutes before uh, we're going to have the, uh, the uh, guest join on. So I, I wanted to kind of take what you're saying and, and apply it to something actually specific that you know that happened at the conference. So one of the one of the um, sessions was a roundtable. There were some industry guys up there, uh, you know, that that, uh, that run midstream groups. And one of the guys was talking about the you know this concept that there really is right now no efficient way for a water transfer company. And I'm, so I'm talking about a company that is utilizing pipeline and trucks to to offload and, and onload water onto you know into an SWD or what have you there's no efficient way at current for those capacities always to be at 100% because you know there's going to be a frack over here you're going to need 300,000 barrels of water this week but then you're not going to you know then you're going to go down to 60,000 barrels and, and and you know so you have that dynamic but then also you don't have the water transfer companies talking to each other to say okay i need you know this much this right. week and then for the next few weeks i'm going to be offloading this and and so rather than finding like an equilibrium and being able to trade information to the point to be able to have a much more efficient system every operator is very close to the vest and only you know only does what they can control and so that's you know i was talking to a group last week um and this you know i, I certainly wouldn't be able to name the company but you know because it's not for public uh, knowledge at all but i mean the company was telling me that when they are over 40% utilized on their pipeline for water, that to them is at full capacity. Wow. Which to me, I mean, so you're, you're, you're baked in into your model of your pro forma for your business. You're baking in that 60% underutilization is maxed out. And, you know, and, and when I look at something like that, you know, I'm sure there's a number, you know, and, and this was one of the bigger firms out there. This wasn't a mom and pop, you know, small potatoes. I mean, this was a firm that if they, you know, if there's an asset, you know, that they want to take down, they have the capital to do so, et cetera. But it just kind of was indicative to me of the, the just the lack of actual transparency. And then so when you take that back to what we were talking about before, you know, I think there needs to be some level of interest in having that transparency and developing that relationship and that trust. Before you actually get to the step of like, okay, let's let's make sure that we hear each other correctly. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I think no. we're almost that's almost like step two in the process. Whereas if you don't have the mutual desire to even get to that space, like you're kind of you're kind of left hanging. You know, one of the things I I had a about a year, maybe two years ago, I had a an idea I was going to float out there and um, put it in a blog or something. I never did, but get your take on this. It ties in that forty percent utilization. Um, one of the things that I thought that the industry should consider adopting for more of the services than it currently currently does is commitment to vendors over the course of the year. So they come in and say, um, 
you know, vendor A, this is what you do. We want, you know, X percentage of your staff and we will pay them whatever the normal is, 40 hours, 60 hours, whatever it is, from January 1 to December 31st. If we don't, there's a buyout clause, whatever. But we want that to ensure that we have these resources on staff. And if you do not devote those resources um, and you start using them for our competitor, then guess what? Um, we, you know, we'll, we'll find you or whatever. I think those conversations, because part of what you're talking about, the 40 percent, if I had to guess, is there a afraid that they're going to get in a bind and they can't, you know, depend on a, on a vendor to, to get them what they need. And so they kind of keep this this uptick instead of sitting down. And I don't know enough about this case. So it's hard for me to speak into that. But instead of sitting down with the vendor, say, OK, you know what? We have 100 projects we're going to do this year. Um, we will, we're going to devote a resources from your company to maintain five or 10, whatever it is. So and that's X amount of dollars, roughly, give or take, because TNM stuff like that. So we're going to guarantee this. And then beyond that, um, we want partial staffing for another five or ten of the projects. So now we have ten projects locked up and partial staffing for the next ten. So 20 projects are not complete, but we have a good framework here. Um, from a vend- from someone who's in the vendor business, that's very helpful for me because you want to keep the client happy, but if, the cli- if you're doing good work for the client, but you, on the flip side, you don't know if the client's going to give you more work or when that work's coming or how it's coming. It makes it very hard for you to schedule. And what happens, Ben, is Ben's pipeline company is depending on R-Square Global to do something. Um, and Ben, because he doesn't have uh, – Ben's a, 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 a project manager. He doesn't have the information on what's next for him. I'm like, hey, Ben, what's going on? Well, I don't know what's going on. I don't know. I'm like, well, okay, well, Nate's company over here is actually going to employ us to go do stuff. And Nate's a direct competitor to Ben. So then we go work for, for Nate while we're waiting on Ben. And then three weeks later, Ben calls back and so now you can you start straining resources um and then ben might have had our a team because he was a good good client but he loses the a team because he couldn't keep us busy and then we go to nate and it wasn't that he couldn't keep us busy it's just there was a small lag he had a three four week lag and he couldn't promise his work so at the end of the day if time is money and it is in this business would it have been more beneficial for ben to lock us up for those four weeks um at least partial time or full time or whatever it is instead of losing those resources to a competitor and then now the competitor has the theoretical a team or whatever it is and they're getting the best benefit and i think those type of things i don't know what the actual answer lies in but i think those transparencies those issues you're talking about they kind of tap into the core to some of the flaws that we see in the industry yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, and it's, I think you're, you know, you're absolutely right, but I think it's even more granular and maybe even, maybe even worse when you're talking about like real time capacity issues yeah. for, so I mean, if you're drilling a well, you, you, you're going to be producing water, right? You, you know, you have water coming out of the ground. You got to do something with it. You can't just sit there. Mm-hmm. And so it's not as though these, you know, so if you have a drilling schedule, you have, you should have some semblance of what water you know, need you're going to have for those things. But what ends up happening is, you know, the rig gets out on location and then they're like, oh, crap, we have to figure out what to do with the water that's going to be coming out of the ground in 36 hours. Right. As opposed to, you know, here's our quarterly projection. It, we're going to be looking at producing these, you know, these amounts of bu- bu- water in these weeks, in these off weeks, we should try to get it from over here or, mm-hmm. or, or, or in these in these major peak weeks. Maybe we need to offload some over here. Like it seems as though. And, and so. Coming full circle, one of the other things that I think this is a little bit uh, high, you know, higher level than what we're talking about, but I think something else to, co- to consider is, so let's say that you're an operator, operator X, and you have a mainstream company that's a, that's a bolt-on that's an ancillary to you. And you know, you, you, uh, the CEO of the exploration company goes to the water team and says, okay, how much money do you need for next year to, 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 do, to do what you need to do? Here's our drilling schedule. Give me a number. And the guy says, okay, we, or, you know, the, the, uh, C, uh, the head of the mission company says, okay, we need $75 million. Okay. So the, so the operator gives, gives $75 million and, and they, you know, that, that's enough for the water you know, co- commitments for that year. Now that, that turns into, I mean, the, the mystery manager no longer has an incentive to return an ROI on that money. It's just, okay, I now have a budget of $75 million to spend as opposed to if, you know, if that number was, okay, I'm going to give it to you on a draw basis as needed, and your mandate is to actually return on investment on this money as opposed to just what do you need to fund the project, 
like you're completely changing the metric. And I know like I'm changing the conversation. No, and I think no, no. I mean, at, at, jumped on. but you know, th- those are the kind of the, the, the um, shifts that you're talking about when you actually talk about on the ground. Yeah. And, and, and no, I think you're, you're right. It's a multi-level problem. Um, I will say that I know from talking to people in the industry, I'm sure you hear this as well, is that, you know, I'm going to sell to this manager in this part, this department, they're incentivized by X, but they also need the buy-in from someone else from some other department and they're incentivized by Y. And well, what I'm trying to pitch to them actually would help both of them out. But because, you know, we're, we're trying to sell it to X really is who we understand that we don't really understand how to connect with Y. And so internally, there's no way to rationalize that because Y's motivation isn't the, sa- uh, is in the same as X. And so you, you have competing interest when in, in, in reality, these publicly traded companies uh, interest should be aligned. And so, you know, I don't know if we have any CEOs of publicly traded companies, but I would say um, it is a common complaint in the industry that um, people are siloed and they don't understand what's going on and it's hard to communicate across across these these platforms and so um i think that's one thing that we we um, as an industry hopefully will do better but anyways with that being said we do have on a guest so we will stop right here and up next we have on tom schweber todd schweber i said tom tom schweber who is a partner at apex strategy todd it's good to have you on today how are you doing sir good thanks for having me guys Okay, first off, you are based on the East Coast over there in Richmond, Virginia, it looks like. Um, but let's talk a little bit about um, who you are, kind of a 30,000-foot view of your background. Um, you have in your LinkedIn profile, which we'll link to in the show notes, that you help with acquisitions, sales, and investment platforms, and attra- uh, attract and close high-value clients and deals through technology. Perfect for this show, but kind of break that down, who you are, what your company does, and uh, what your background is for the listeners. Yeah, quick quick background. Uh, started off kind of in the finance world. Did the Wall Street Shuffle right out of right out of college, WVU Mountaineers. Um, after uh, after a few 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 hardcore years in New York, I transitioned out to Colorado. Still in the finance world, but focused on capital markets and and really started getting my hands uh, dirty into the startup space out there. Uh, which brought me back to the East Coast with a company called Living Social right around the time that we took on about $250 million from uh, Amazon and Bezos and family um, and, uh, and, and really kind of, kind of uh, uh, pushed me forward into the love of, of emerging companies, uh, disruptive platforms, if you will. Uh, so I stayed... Uh, very close to the emerging emerging startup, uh, pre-rev, pre-funded uh, companies and businesses from coast to coast, um, and and with one foot in the capital markets as much as possible. Uh, that brought me to Wealth Forge, where um, my marketing and, and branding uh, background was was used to help scale a a private placement security transaction platform uh, for uh, a broker dealer, Wealth Forge Securities, uh, who is breaking the mold, so to say, as far as online security transactions. And, and from there, uh, I found a, a, a niche uh, through uh, through uh, a couple of buddies back in West Virginia, uh, John Perry specifically, who was putting together a uh, uh, an oil and gas property rights uh, platform um, needed to put a couple of dollars together to get started, and uh, and so he gave me a call. Uh, we we put some money together and uh, and started buying, selling, leasing, acquiring, divesting, uh, trading uh, property rights. Um, all through the all through the the, the empowerment of technology. And, and I would say online strategies and processes that nobody else was really using kind of brought with me through my, uh, my experiences in the digital world. Long wind, long winded, but, uh, I think that, that gives you kind of an idea of where I'm coming from, where I'm at right now. Okay, great. I do want to talk about the technologies. Um, if we can, I want to follow up on one of the things Ben and I were just talking about before you hopped on. And we, we talked about this a few times on the show about messaging, conveying message. Um, you know, you know, how hard that is to do sometimes. And, you know, some of the, the ways that you can do it in a manner that, um, ensures that you get your message across. You've kind of had your hands with a lot of, uh, different people, some high ticket folks, um, um, as well, folks on the ground. 
when you go into something and you're trying to convey a message or talk about your technology and kind of the message it conveys as well, but how do you make sure that you frame things in a manner that's helpful for the, the audience? Um, do you do you customize your, your pitch to um, the personnel? Do you kind of have a broad thing and then, you know, uh, bounce it, um, uh, kind of move it around depending on how they respond? How do you set it up so that you ensure um, that folks are understanding and comprehending uh, what it is that you're trying to offer when you're putting together a deal? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it really comes down to knowing knowing your audience, right? Knowing your market. Uh, it's it's really tough to, to 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 frame anything if you don't have a have a very intimate understanding of who it is you're trying to communicate with. Um, one of the one of the most uh, I think simple ways to get to know that market or that audience or whoever the other person is that you're trying to get is is, is by asking questions. I'm a big fan of asking. Uh, to really uncover, um, in a lot of cases, needs or desires, wants, et cetera, um, prior to ever going on a mass basis anyway, um, to, to communication. Um, so that's, that's one of the things that we, we have a challenge with a lot of our clients in, in Apex, uh, where we're, we're powering a lot of, uh, the top of the funnel activity as far as strategy, process, and systems. But messaging is still something I think has to come from inside inside the walls of uh, the respective company and business, right? Um, uh, you know, we work with groups that are in healthcare, uh, oil and gas, real estate. Each, each one of those groups has its own, its own insight Right. That, that they are that they know they know that space. They know their market. They know their audience better than anybody else. So that really that messaging and that framework really needs to come from within. We can help by asking and giving them the tools to go out and find out more details from their clients or from their prospective clients. But the messaging really comes from from, you know, deep down inside of the organization. So, so Todd, I, I wanted to shift gears a little bit and uh, take advantage of the fact that you, uh, you know, your experience is predominantly out of Marcellus and Utica, you know, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Ohio uh, area, and, and a lot of the listeners are, are certainly uh, you know more West Texas focused and, and out here, uh, yeah, out in Midland or the surrounding area. So I'm curious, can, can you give us just like a maybe a 30 second elevator speech or kind of arrow view what what you're seeing in the market these days in terms of you know mineral rights and maybe you know how this market is is as it you know compared to what it was maybe 18 months ago. And then also get, kind of give us a synopsis on kind of what you're, what you're seeing in the natural gas markets as we're moving into 2020. Kind of give us a, a market overview, if you would. Yeah, so I have a unique, I guess I have a unique um, stance, uh, specifically in the, in, the, in the app basin, um, as, you know, I, 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 I have, uh, I, we have Relic Energy Management, and then I also have Hoglick Aggregate. And, and so Relic Energy Management, super upstream and, and dealing with, you know, uh, um, uh, minerals, property rights, uh, trying to be before the bit, if you will. Um, uh, and, you know, we'll start there. Uh, a lot of private equity money, um, a lot of we'll started private equity money has really kind of, I don't want to say dried up. But has become so very conservative in their uh, in their parameters and their mandates that you know uh, any type of middlemen or intermediary uh, focus or positioned groups out there have really had to focus on uh, a quality over quantity, right? Um, so 18 months ago. You know, running a a, a very a very very uh, intensive inbound strategy, shotgun approach marketing uh, was was killing it. You know, um, fast forward to today, if you don't have a sniper rifle and you can't hit a target from five miles out, I, I mean, it's going to be tough to to put a deal together, market it, and get any type of of uh, margin worth um, worth your time and effort. You know, um, so that's that's one of the things I've I've really noticed. Um, as far as the operators are concerned, you know, leasing is almost non-existent at this point. I think there's a lot of baseball card trading taking place, and even that slowed down from last year. 
um, where, where, you know, operators were trading, you know, bits and pieces of acreage just to bolt on to their primary positions. Um, but it, like I said, even, even that seems to have, have slowed down, uh, almost to a halt. Um, one of the unique, I guess, you know, insights I have from, from being a part of hoglick aggregates, which is kind of centralized when you look at the map of the, the app basin, it's North central West Virginia, uh, Marion County. And really where a lot of, you know, the 50 mile radius where a lot of, uh, exploration and activity pipeline build out, et cetera, uh, has taken place or was set to take place. And even that you're seeing come to a very abrupt slowdown, almost halt, um, where, you know, the, 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 the oil and gas companies aren't, uh, aren't exploring, um so we thought well there's still production there's still going to be and even that started slowing down you start to hear um uh, rumors a few months ahead of time and then you know based on the the aggregate business model where we're kind of focused on that midstream almost a little bit more than anything else i mean we, we certainly provide aggregate to well build out et cetera. but you know our big our big market is the the pipeline slip repair, pipeline build out, et cetera. And that's, you know, that's a scary place to be right now. You know, a lot of the pipelines have been kind of delayed and delayed and delayed and delayed. And it's, it's a pretty expensive space to, to, to keep, keep delaying. If you know what I mean? So um, I think, I think, uh, you know, over the next 12, 24, 24 months, really, um, hopefully you see, you see the, you see the market, um, uh, you'll see the market condense. It's already condensing, but you'll, you'll start to see the market become even more efficient mm -hmm. from top to bottom. And that starts even with the land groups out there that, you know, I've never seen so much waste guys, and, and, you know, I, and I, I'm coming from the financial world, you know, um, capital markets, et cetera, where there is just very little efficiency, very opaque. There was no transparency. And that's, that's really I, the best I can equate the, the land management um, side of the business to is just, I mean, absolutely um, really wasteful in, in, in more and more, more ways than one. Um, yeah. I mean, very, to, very go ahead. To, no, I was going to say, I mean, to that point, right. I think right before you got on Ryan and I were talking about the fact that, you know, I think one of the overarching themes that we're seeing across the market is this, you know, this shift between, okay, here's our CapEx for the year and, and our our model is to produce as much oil or gas as we possibly can to, okay, let's actually talk about getting an ROI for our business and, and an ROI for our, you know, our economies of scale as opposed to just racing to, you know, to produce as much as possible kind of irrespective of, of the back end. And I think that's kind of what isn't you're... That, isn't that a novel idea though? It's like, it, it kind of gave me a, because it, I, I saw it in the startup world, which, you know, when I say startup, it kind of gives me shivers. I, I hate the word startup because <laughs> in my mind, I, I always, you know, you found these startups, quote unquote startups who really didn't have a model for anything. Maybe they had a really great management team who had raised money before or, you know, had done something great in their previous life. And, you know, they kind of had a name and people were willing to give them money they just kind of went through that cash and never really had, you know, a real business plan in mind, like, like bringing in money, right? <laughs> like, right. Like, like creating revenue and value, you know, it was all like, let's, let's burn as much as possible. I, and I get the model, right. And scale and blah, blah, blah. But it's, it, you know, at the end of the day, I think wall street, the lenders, the institutions, investors in general, uh, are tired of that game, especially in the, in the energy space. You know, yeah. I think you had a lot of great, brilliant minds out there with wonderful management teams who put together wonderful pitches and showed like you know fairy tale growth and yada yada, but never really were able to execute. And that to me is pretty important. You know, one of the things uh, I'm curious um, from where you're at in the space is uh, you talk about about waste and stuff. Um, how much do you think that is um, – there's a lot of narratives about why the oil and gas industry 
does what it does. And I think some of them are true and some of them aren't necessarily, um, are, are a little bit further for the truth. And, and so one narrative is, well, you know, we got it's got to be safe. Everything's got to be safe. And so you start changing things. Um, you know, people's lives could be in danger. And I think depending on what you're talking about, technology coming in, people dying, obviously. Okay. I get that one. Um, there's also this talk around, Hey, the old guard, the older folks, they don't like technology. And so they like doing stuff the way they are. I think there might be something, um, to that as well. Um, but I've often wondered how much are the inefficiencies because there's a pride in the fact that people like doing things the way they like, they like them done. <laughs> and it's really, you know what, we've done it this way for 20 years and I like it that way. And I don't know if it's change is scary, more of there's a pride in what they've done. And now we're seeing because we can, uh, there's so many vendors now. The industry has exploded so much over the past, you know, uh, you know, 15 years that you get a lot of perspectives, and all of a sudden these inefficiencies are glaring because people like me and you and Ben, we work for multiple different companies, and so we can see when a company does something really well versus a company that does something very poor because we can, you know, we can compare and contrast because we're on the outside looking in. Um, how do you, how much do you think that kind of uh, contributes to what we see in the industry when we talk about inefficiencies? Look, I think I think if you're not growing your business, if you're not improving in efficiencies, if you're not thinking about your shareholders or your investors, uh, I I think you're dead, and you may not even know it, right? I mean, I I just that that old adage, hey, this is we do it this way because this is the way it's always been done. I mean, how many times have we just seen companies fade away and die because mm-hmm. that's that that was their model? I mean, we see. Like I said, not to not to con- continuously compare this space and and what we're going through right now with financial markets, but it's the same it's it's the same thing I've seen in fin- in the financial world as, as the real estate world, and you know in my mind you're you're always too early until you're too late, right? So there's there's a lot of groups, there's a lot of forward thinkers, thought leaders out there that the old guard is saying they're crazy or we're not going to work with them because of X, Y, and Z and they don't get it. And, you know, this is a handshake type of a, of a, of an industry and, you know, we need to be belly to belly. And I I think that they're, you know, the natural progression here is that the old guard at some point is going to die out and that may piss a lot of people off, but it's just, it's what happens. And you got to look at who's going to be sitting in their seats next gen. Right. Um, There's not too many. Too ahead, many next gen guys come in that don't know how to operate, you know, through systems and technology, or expect that there's data mm-hmm. at the click of a button mm-hmm. for them to work off of. And I think that that the market's going to force these companies to get in line. On your point about the financial stuff, one of the things that's fascinating me was um, Robinhood. You know, they came out I don't know, a couple of years ago with uh, basically unlimited unlimited trades are free, and then just what the past few weeks ago we see Charles Schwab, TD Ameritrade, they're all you know getting rid of the trading fees and they're moving to that model. And it felt like those institutions were you know hoping that Robinhood um, wouldn't be sustainable. And we can talk about you know, what they do with their money and you know all that a separate time. But but there's there's a sense in which it felt like the bigger institutions were almost resistant to this idea, and now all of a sudden they're like, hey, you can buy. A fractional shares and we're not going to charge you for trading fees um and to me that's a sign that that i don't know if robin hood will be sustainable long term but there's a growing fear amongst those institutions that if they don't make a shift now that they will begin to lose market share to an app on your phone called robin hood and so um i think you i think you're there, there's do you, would you agree that those are the type of trends that almost had to happen where um, this kind of idea is like, I don't know if this is going to work, and all of a sudden you start to see everyone now has to adopt it because they're afraid of losing market share? Yeah, of course. I mean, I think market share is in the back of everybody's mind, especially when there's disruptive models and, and technology that come about. I think that, you know, for the most part, in any industry, okay, this is what you're going to find in any industry, you're going to start seeing kind of this disintermediation where there's there's less and less middle middlemen working, whether you're a, a Charles Schwab platform or a broker on the stock exchange or a broker out in the app basin buying and selling or flipping acreage or uh, somebody raising capital for a fee. Those margins are going to continue to get smaller and smaller. And you're going to see a shift in these industries as you already have you know, real estate, finance, and the energy industry right now, you're going to start seeing a shift from those guys who are in the middle, men and women in the middle, to start catering towards one side of the fence or the other. They're either going to start going towards and servicing the private equity or the operator specifically, 
and, and working with them on their side of the table, or they're going to, they're going to jump over and kind of side with the, the product and, 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 and the owners, the, the property owners and the deal uh, or, or the asset owners. Right. And, um, and they'll, they'll provide services, right? I think managed services is really where everything's going. Managed services to me, there's all this technology and all these new platforms and systems out there, but there's very limited resources in, in house at any energy company, which is probably why the rate of adoption has been so low because there's a fear, right? There's, 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 there's an education, there's a learning curve. There's a fear of, Hey, where's my data going? Every oil and gas company out there thinks that their database is just, you know, the most it's proprietary and it's, it's their, it's their secret sauce, you know? So they, 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 they're very hesitant to, to signing up to a third party application, CRM, you know, title track and whatever it is, because they feel like their data is at risk. Right. But you're going to start seeing that that the, the managed services space is going to be a really, really big industry to help these organizations, big or small, manage the efficiency that comes with systems, strategy, processes. So, Todd, I'm curious if you have any thought, on, any thoughts on this. So circling back to something we mentioned a few minutes ago where we were talking about, you know, essentially at a high level, you, know, you either evolve or die. You know, coming at that from the reverse angle, you know, I think all three of us, if we thought about it, have, I mean, at least I, I have a litany of examples that I could point to that, you know, a firm executed one thing or another extremely well and then they decided to diversify their offering and do things that they really didn't have an expertise in and that turned out to kind of be the downfall or the thing that they they took on too broad of a focus and so i wanted to see if you may have if you had any thoughts on kind of the the difference maybe between evolving and staying you know staying current and staying ahead of the trends as opposed to Try, you know, getting outside the sandbox, so to speak, because uh, I know that you know, with, with someone with as experience with experience, you know, as, as vast and kind of dynamic as you have, you, you may have some thoughts on kind of how to play that side. Yeah, no, look, I, I think it, it goes back to the old Russian proverb, right? It's it's you chase two rabbits, you end up with none, and and I think you see that a lot with companies that you know might be doing something or one thing very very well, and then they decide to go and, and diversify into something else. But I think going back to evolve or die, I, I wasn't necessarily saying, "Hey, you need to start ten different business lines, even though you're 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 best at one." I'm talking about becoming more efficient and scalable in whatever it is that you are the best at or you have a passion for. You know, um, if 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 the markets are emerging and you see other opportunities and you're already in line and, and you're already set up and your infrastructure is there and your talent pool of resources and in house um, or or at least uh, reachable are 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 there and you can quickly turn on that business unit, then go for it. But I, I wouldn't dump all your eggs in that basket. Right. I think you start you start with what you know. Uh, you, you, you kind of, you rinse and repeat what's worked, which if you have strategy and process, right. Which a lot of these, uh, I, I feel like a lot of, a lot of teams forget or just aren't doing very well. You should be able to rinse and repeat a lot of those moving over to a new, a new line of business. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I think that's, that's a good clarification. So let's talk about Apex. Um, let's, let's circle back around there for a few minutes. Um, refresh everyone, um, who you guys are, what you guys do. You talked about a couple different industries, maybe at a high level, um, um, you know, where you touch those industries at, and then we'll kind of dig in there a little bit more. Yeah, so Apex, Apex kind of powered just about all of, all of my ventures, um, which is really, you know, how, how can we get more with less? Right? How can we get more clients with less time spent? How can we get more revenue with without taking on more uh, more staff or more risk? Right? It's always everybody. Every business has this. I want more with less X. Right? And so Apex is is essentially a, it's a managed service company and consultancy that helps establish built businesses kind of grow their marketing and sales and acquisitions to the highest points possible through strategy process and technology what does that mean it means look there's a cheaper faster better way 
to do a lot of the things that you're doing, especially whenever it comes to top of the funnel, mid funnel, lead gen and growth initiatives, right? There's a there's an intersection kind of taking place between sales and marketing, and, and we'll call that revenue or growth. And um, a lot of that can be can be managed through technology and these systems that that are rolling out almost on an hourly basis at this point. But there still needs to be human capital, human intelligence kind of driving a lot of those. And a lot of teams just aren't equipped to do that. And that's really what Apex brings to the table. Um, I, you know, I've personally gone through the pains of, of banging my head up against the wall late nights trying to figure out how I'm going to bring in more deal flow, how I'm going to convert that deal flow, how I'm going to convert to people who don't convert after the first call, how I'm going to do all of this, how I'm going to get more data, how can I get in touch with everybody in the world by a click of a button, how can I, you know, it's all of these things that keep guys like us up every mm-hmm. night. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I started working with some really, really talented marketers and, and, and guys, women and women and men that were kind of transforming the digital landscape. Um, so we wrapped up, uh, apex strategy, not too long ago, formalized it. There's myself, uh, Matt Patoli and Grant Cooper. Um, you can look them up. They are experienced, successful entrepreneurs, marketers. They have successful exits and, uh, and also other successful, uh, ventures building out robust, kind of uh, platforms and, and cultures, um, niche cultures, uh, all using that, 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 that philosophy and that strategy to grow fast. Um, so one of the things you, you've, you've used the word marketing a few times. I want, from your, your vantage point, um, tell me how you think marketing and sales, how they go together, who serves who, um, you know, what should each be gleaning from each other? Um, because you, you've, I think that's a, a fascinating discussion that kind of gets lumped together and probably um, not teased out enough. Yeah. So to me, to me, you know, you can't really have a conversation about sales without marketing or marketing without sales. Right. I mean, everything that marketing does is for sales and, and sales is, uh, you know, if, if sales sales needs to work very closely with marketing, take that baton and bring home the gold, you know, to convert. So I think of everything kind of in a funnel. I think of marketing as far as, you know, the promotion of or the pull of uh, a, a, a prospective clients, lead, lead gen, et cetera, into the top of the funnel. Um, and, and then throughout, you know, the drop in that funnel, how, how is marketing kind of nurturing leads or nurturing the conversations, nurturing, building these relationships in a way that makes it very easy for sales to kind of pick up the baton, pick up the reins, take, take that conversation over, convert or add value to um, and, and close the deal. You know, whether that's acquisitions or sales, whether it's a widget or, you know, uh, uh, oil and gas property for $10 million, I think it's all it's all very similar in that you got to bring in you got to bring in the conversations. Right. Um, I'm a I'm a numbers guy. So the more numbers you throw into the top of the uh, of the of the funnel, um, you know, the the better your results are going to be at the bottom of it. Um, And what happens within that funnel, you know, there the two worlds really do collide. Marketing is, is set up with funnels or, uh, or systems that will, will qualify, sift and sort and bucket all of these audiences and, and wonderful people that are coming in because they see value in, in the marketing messages and sales should be completely aligned with those, those messages and, um, and be able to go ahead and, and, and convey the value uh, and, and like I said, bring the, uh, bring the clothes home. Okay. And, and one follow up to that real quick is, um, if you, if you, th- if you take that, Ben and I were talking about before we got on about different folks and, uh, you know, you know, you have a big company and they're trying to sell to, you know, Bob in this department and Sally is over here in this department. And so the sales guys out there are trying to sell to Bob, but it's Bob and Sally and Bob and Sally have different points of entry that they're trying to, uh, or different reasons for making decisions. Um, so we hear this complaint a lot. From a marketing standpoint, how can marketing come in um, and, and service sales to where the message can be distributed differently, but the right message can get to the right person? Or would you say that maybe marketing is more to help glean that information so that the salespeople um, can understand that the messaging needs to change on, on the ground level? 
Yeah, that's a loaded question, you know, and it's one that that I think a lot of groups battle with. I think that um, you need to be specific to who you're going you to to who whoever the the marketing side of the business is needs to be as specific as possible. They need to understand who they're going after, understanding that there's more than one decision maker. Um, it, 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 the the initial marketing message, however, needs to be targeted to one or the other, or vague enough to to at least elicit some type of interest from the the broader company perspective. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, absolutely, Todd. I know that we're we're running out of time. Here. I had one more question. I wanted to see if you can. Uh, you, I know that even you know, even as much as I feel like I have a finger on the pulse and you know I'm uh, you know I'm consistently up to date on uh, blockchain and data and those kind of markets that, that may scare some people away just because of just the vast you know amount of information that, that can be consumed. I was curious if you can kind of at a high level uh, give us a picture on kind of how you. I think you have a really, you know, an interesting way and a very effective way of intersecting data and data aggregation to actually uh, deploy, you know, in a business strategy as opposed to just. I feel like a lot of times, uh, you know, it's almost like there's almost there's all this data out there, but once I have the data, like how do I actually turn that into, you know, actionable stuff or takeaways that I can actually improve my business on? So what are some of the things that you're looking at when you're, you know, trying to aggregate data or kind of how, how do you approach that problem? Uh, you know, that's another, that's another loaded question, uh, but here's how I think about data. I think about it from a sales, from a, from an entrepreneur's standpoint, right? So I, I, I know that I need to make X number of dollars. And this was kind of something that was beat into me as a sales guy way back when, and I'm sure you guys do something similar, but da- data to me in, in the world that I live in, um, it, it kind of looks like this. If I put X number of dollars into the top of the funnel, let's go back to the funnel, right? Then I get X number of dollars out of the funnel. So if I put X number of dollars into advertising and marketing and communication and purchasing data uh, and, and promotion, how much is that going to yield me in, you know, in, in revenue or income? Um, you can back into those numbers as much as you want thing about technology and the data that we have through a lot of these mediums and platforms or, or search is that you have demographics, you have the, the, you have the insight and the transparency into conversions that you typically wouldn't have, right? I know exactly how many people are engaging with my content. I know exactly how many people are clicking through to my content. I know exactly how many people are converting once they get into my funnel. And I can back my numbers into a very clear ROI on any type of money or resource spend that I put at the top of the uh, top of the funnel. It's predictable revenue, right? And with mm-hmm. predictable revenue, then I can I can choose to keep it where it is or continue to pump more dollars into the jukebox, right? And, and it, depending on the market, depending on the ceilings that that are that are that are in place in those type of markets or different industries, you should see a corresponding lift in revenue. Okay, um, Ben and I had to slap ourselves on the wrist. We talked about respecting people's time, and we are four minutes past our time with you. So we do apologize for that. Uh, we do thank you for being gracious with your time, though, and tell people where they can connect with you um, if they want to hear more about what you guys have going on. Absolutely. Uh, apexstrategyco.com is under construction, but please check us out. Keep visiting. We should be live here in the next week or so. You can always find me on LinkedIn as well as Matt Patoli or Grant Cooper for any type of growth or revenue scaling projects that you may have. Um, and then, of course, we have Relic Energy Management in the App Basin for any of your land and um, mineral needs. Okay. Thank you so much for your time. Um, it was good to talk to you again. And uh, best of luck to you, sir, in the future. And I'm sure we'll have you on again at some point to kind of talk about where you guys are at, you know, six, eight months down the road. Appreciate it, Todd. Love the show, guys. Thanks again. Thank Thanks. you. And once again, that was Todd Schwerber with Apex Strategy. Um, we went five minutes over there, Ben, with him. Um, I think there's one person we can all agree to blame. Right. 
I mean, you know, the only I mean the only possible option here is option A, which is Nate. Eight, yeah, A, a and eight, yeah. That's that's there is no option B, C, or D. It's the easiest question on the test. I mean, you never blame the guest. You never blame the guest. So that goes away. Um, me and you are professional podcast hosts with multiple hundreds and hundreds of episodes experience behind under our belt. So it can't be us. So it has to be. I mean, we could blame the internet connection, but the internet didn't cut out for me. Did it cut out for you? Okay, no, so it's not the internet. Okay, so yeah, it just leaves Nate. Okay, yeah, good point. A is Nate. By process of elimination, the Venn diagram says Nate. Nate, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ben, it was good to get back on here. We will be off again next week because I will be in China going to close phase one and probably phase two of the U.S.-China trade deal because what else am I going to do while I'm over there? Ben, what will you be doing while I am curing international problems? First of all, I wouldn't say that too loud, or uh, the the POTUS might might subtweet you and and uh, put you on the case hey, for real. He hey, might he hey, might send you over to Z. Well, I'll get I mean, it. You, you better be careful. Hold on, hold on. We didn't even talk about the fact that I am now a formally recognized international policy expert. We didn't even we haven't even talked about that on this show, but we will. I'm sure I will gloat about I'm actually that. Actually, surprised. I'm surprised you didn't superimpose the picture or the plaque <laughs> like, over your face for the podcast. I mean, I figured I figured all I was going to see on your screen was just the plaque that just said whatever hackathon master or whatever it was. Um, I mean, again, I think we talked about it on the last podcast, but we probably shouldn't dive too deeply into you um, in you know instrumental in winning a Chinese U.S. hackathon. We probably shouldn't talk about that. Yeah, yeah, the hackathon was an interesting choice of words there. I get what they mean, <laughs> but I've had a lot of people like, what are you doing with China and hacking again? It's like, well, no, 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 it's not that kind of hacking. Not publicly, at least. But no, it's not that kind of hacking. So it was an interesting choice of words for um, the implications between those those U.S.-China relations there. But um, but yeah, I want, to, I want to break it down. I'll tell you what, next time, I'll let you interview me on how to be a foreign policy expert. That's that that should that should be the next show. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyways, Ben, it was good. You will be in Midland. Are you going to be working the next couple of weeks, or what are you going to do? Like you usually shut down October. You've worked well past your normal time for this year. So, um, will you be working November, December, or when do you come back from your high? You're like a bear. I mean, you like. Depends. It depends on how you qualify work. I mean, some people might qualify that I don't work a day out of the year at all. I mean, it kind of all depends on what what you mean by work. I was being generous. Um, but, uh, I was being generous. I appreciate that. Um, I can never tell with you. Uh, no, I'm, I'm uh, closing a pretty big acquisition either Friday of this week or Tuesday, Wednesday of next week, to kind of depending on how quickly we can get to the table on some things. And then um, got a couple other things in the works. But, I mean, as you know, the Q4 is generally pretty slow. And in this market, I'm not expecting there to be anything gangbusters but uh, just looking forward to budgeting for 2020 right so your q4 is slow mine is solving international trade deals and traveling the world yeah q4 is terribly slow you're right it's so slow yeah what would i do with all this free time it must be nice to work like half years so anyways for ben samuels this is ryan ray saying we will talk to you in two weeks two weeks